She is the world's most subscribed mentalist. Introducing award-winning Suhani Shah, everyone. I think I was six years old and I watched a magic program. I was so amazed by what I saw. Like I'm seven years old, eight years old. I see myself in papers. My holdings are there. People want my autograph. My father said, we have to choose between whether she sits in a class of 60 or performs in front of 60,000. So decision's very clear. We do not read minds. We only give an illusion of doing so. They see a eight-year-old girl flying in the air, uh, levitating a car. They would ask me to cure them of their problems through magic. There's a robbery in town. People have come to me and asked me to find who's the culprit using my magical powers. I will not take advantage of the mystery of the art form. Like you don't know how yeah. I perform it so I can say anything and you have to believe me because I'm doing it. I don't want to do that. What is it that comes to your mind? A place in Italy. Does that make any sense? Welcome to Feel It In Your Soul. My guest today is a phenomenon taking India by storm. She is the world's most subscribed mentalist. She's a magician, a therapist, and known lovingly as the Jadu Buddy, AKA the Magic Fairy. <laughs> Introducing award-winning and an absolute all-round delight, Suhani Shah, everyone! <laughs> Thank you so much. That's such kind words for me. Yay. So, <laughs> Suhani, so I actually came across you in London, I'm on Instagram. I'm like, who is this girl? She is amazing. I was like addicted to everything that you were putting on. So I was like, I need to, I need to get to speak to her. So thank you for agreeing to do this. That's so sweet. Thank you for having me. No worries. So I feel like a little bit like you might be able to preempt my questions. So hold oh, back damn. a little bit. <laughs> She's already knowing what I'm going to ask. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, I like to understand a little bit about those younger formative years. Right, when you're running around and you're, because I, you know, when I read your backstory, you performed at seven. I mean, yes. I don't know how you even, what are you doing at five that you start performing at seven? So tell me a little bit about what got you there and, and how did you kind of figure out that you had this talent? Well, I, um, I think I was six years old and I watched a, a magic program with Telecaster. It was, and then, I was so amazed by what I saw. Like there was a magician who disappeared a prop and then it appeared out of an apple. And I was like, oh, this is so fascinating. And I wanted to do it. I didn't, I didn't, I think all of us, we all get attracted towards yeah. magic. It's a very fascinating art form. So did I. But instead of just watching more of magic, I wanted to perform more magic. Like I wanted to become a magician. I wanted to tell my dad that this is what I want to do. So I walked up to my father. And I told him uh, that I want to become a magician. I want to do karna hai, yeah. you know, in Hindi. And then he was like, okay, go and study. <laughs> you know, because I would come and say a new thing every day. Yeah. Um, and some of it he would take seriously because I was already doing a lot of things. Even before I started performing magic, I was uh, I was a swimming champion in my club, in my state. Yeah. I was studying decently well. I mean, six, now, yeah. six years, what will you study? Yeah. So I was into computers a lot. So I was doing a lot of things already and my father was like, how much is she going to do? So he was like, yeah, okay. But then I walked up to him again. Uh, and again. Yeah. And again. And I kept walking up to him till he didn't take this thing seriously. Like, I know that once he takes it seriously and he knows and he believes that I am serious about what I'm talking, he will support me. But how do I make him believe this? Yeah. And one day it happened. One day he was like, are you really sure that you want to do this? And I'm like, yes. And I displayed one act, which I don't know how I did that. Um, I took um, I took his handkerchief and my mother was making chapatis to the dough. And yeah. I stuck it. I made like a band out of it. I stuck it on my eyes. I asked my dad to tie the handkerchief around my eyes. And I started writing whatever he wrote. Like if he wrote something, I would write the same thing. I was very young to like understand a lot of writing, but I could yeah. just write the same thing. He wrote in a different language and I could write in Gujarati also, in Hindi also, in English also. So, when he saw that, oh, she really can do what she's saying, um, he then took it seriously and then he supported me. Then it was a, after convincing my parents, it was a journey of like seven months, then three, okay, so around 10 to 11 months it took to you know find people to teach because there was nobody teaching yeah. magic still nobody teaches magic there was no internet no youtube videos no courses to learn so we struggled a lot to find people who could teach me magic and a very interesting thing happened there no magician agreed to teach but near Ahmedabad that is a place I was staying in a small village 
I found this. We found this group of people, a family, in fact. Yeah. Who were assistants to magicians in their shows. Wow. So, like the main, uh, the the head of the family was the main light and music technician. Right. Okay. His wife was the lead assistant to a magician. The other two sisters were the side assistants. The cousins were like the people who would make the set and all. So basically, it was a family who would assist magicians in their shows and make the show for them. And somehow we convinced them to teach me magic, and they did. So usually, a magician trains assistants, assistant. Yes. But for me, it was the other way around. The assistants trained me to become a magician. That's once, amazing. Exactly. Once they got convinced that it was another three months uh, of like. You know, we would. There was somebody would say dialogues. I would listen and yeah. try to remember it. The set was being made. Things were getting choreographed. And my father was very clear that if you want to perform, it will not be in a school or a party. You don't waste your talent. If you have potential, then make it large. So then it was about if you want to perform, it has to be a big stage show. That's amazing, actually, that your dad was able to kind of almost give you that rather than you going. It's a little thing that I do, a little side hobby. It's like from a young age, you were like. This is going to be something, yeah. and you kind of had like this feel it in your soul moment at that age. You must have been able to enroll your family. Like when they saw you, they were like, "She's not mucking around. She's a hundred percent committed." Where had, do you think that level of commitment came from? Like, is it something that you saw in your parents, or is it just something innately that comes from I within? Think, aren't we all curious beings? I yeah. think you know. And as kids, we have a lot more time to explore. And I think I was just that. I think I want to for that commitment. I think I want to give entire credit to my parents for that. Yeah. Because as kids, I was like, I feel, I feel like my parents always keep saying, "You were a different kid. You wanted to do." Th-. For me, I, I feel I am what I am. Yeah. But then, like, before even I started magic, I wanted to do swimming. I love swimming. And then they were like, "Okay, then you have to win Olympics." That was the I I knew about Olympics when I was six years old. And um, if I'm going to school, okay, then you you score well. You get the first rank. others what are you doing like and it's not that difficult if somebody can get it then even you can get it yeah. they didn't they made winning easy for me they made like you just give your best and you will win it's not rocket science yeah. and i was being told all this when i was like 5 years old and 6 years old so it was like okay i mean that that's is that's how it is yeah that is so interesting because i mean i've got kids of my own and you just really you know listening to that whatever you you're playing out that young mind is actually going rather than thinking how am i going to do this is one in a million chance can anyone you literally were like hey i can do this is no problem and so you literally as a parent kudos to your mom and dad exactly. that they literally saw there's something here and we need to create the environment that she can literally spread her wings and fly so that that's an amazing achievement for your parents as well rather than sure. giving the whole kind of narrative of you know you need to just study or you need to like be in this box you know you're a girl growing up you know get married you know you hear all these things even though i'm born in london i heard a lot of those stereotypes growing up so i've got to say big hats off to your mum and dad 100%. for doing that 100% i mean uh, not just i think it's about parents so i have a, my brother's 5 years older to me yeah. and both of us were made to sit in every family discussion we you know sometimes we were asked What do you think about should we buy this or not? And we were like, we don't know. But then they were, we were still asked, and we were made to feel important. Like yeah. your opinion matters. You are an important person. We were made to feel like that. Anything we say, um, like like about magic. I know the third time I'm going to go and the fourth time I'm going to go, they're going to agree to what I'm saying. Yeah. Like I know at one point when they realize I'm serious, they're going to agree. So like my brother, in fact, used to be like, I'm so afraid to say anything because they'll to agree. <laughs> You no, know, sometimes kids just yeah. say things. We 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 used to be very careful about what we are talking because our parents are going to say yes. They took it seriously. Yes, we yeah. were never taken as a hey, you're yeah, a kid. Yeah, but like doesn't matter. Never. You know. We were taken very seriously. In fact, you talk about schooling. So, uh, I want to quote my mother over here. After one year into doing magic, um, it we had to take a, make a decision because I was performing magic in a very conventional Indian traditional format. Yeah, like we had two trucks of goods, thirty people to assist me, the same troop. and um, we used to travel from city to city yeah. like one month one city we are performing every day two shows on the weekend sometimes three shows and my entire life is just performing every day that's all i know now so sometimes my exams uh, used to come in between and i have to leave for my exams so yeah. three months i'll go prepare for my exams and give exams and then be back and then go again and then be back it it felt like it was distracting i couldn't do any of it well 
Mm. And also the employment of thirty people, and the entire troop stops for three months, and the entire uh, it wasn't going smooth that way. So it came a point where he had to make a decision: either she's going to continue with her schooling or magic, because it's not going to work out this way. It takes a toll on mental health. It takes yeah. a toll on you know what does she want to do in life and things like that. And I remember we were sitting there in a room, my mom, dad, and me, and my mom happened to say something so interesting. She said that. Oh, first my father said that either she has to. We have to choose between whether she sits in a class of sixty or performs in front of sixty thousand. So decision is very clear. And my mother said that somebody who wants to learn will learn from anywhere. Yeah. And the one who doesn't want to learn, you put the person in the best of the school, they'll fail. So the school is only a medium for my child to learn. If she doesn't go to school, doesn't mean she won't learn. So I'll make sure that she learns and she learns through life and. Well, and did you feel because I know that you did kind of a lot of homeschooling so that you could deal with that? Did you feel because you're so personable? I think, and I'll I'll come on to this in a minute. There is something more than the magic, which is the connection that you create. I think there's the the magic in the connection. Um, but did you feel that you know not having that kind of playground, meeting up with your friends? Did your friends feel it was easy to connect with you, or kind of like, did you feel like it's very hard for me to have friends because they don't really understand my life? How did your kind of friend circle work, or did is it more that you were with your family and that was your circle? So my troop was my circle. Yeah, you know, the, the assistants and the technicians, they became like my friends because school was. I hardly could go to school. I could hard like by the time I could make friends, I, I'd quit schooling. But even in there, I had like one or two people friends who stayed. You know, even from childhood, like I'm still friends with them, and they stayed because I felt they understood. But otherwise, I feel like I wasn't understood. I I didn't feel relatable. Like mm. I couldn't even if I go to my city and I meet them some days, I didn't. I felt like my life is so different, and I felt like I was a misfit. Mm. I feel they all are normal, and there's something wrong with me. uh and i have felt that way and i've gone through that entire period of uh, you know feeling rejected yeah. i do not have friends nobody loves me you lock yourself in the bathroom and cry we all i'm assuming all of us have done it and so have i yeah i've done that bit i've gone through that phase of feeling extremely lonely and also going through you know that kind of when you're kind of going through that teenage mode it mm. it is you know it's you know all the hormones are going and you're going through so much in terms of your you know career that's happening which people would do kind of later on let's say when they get to 20 or what have you you're already dealing with that and in that time you're also growing up and finding out about yourself how did you kind of get into the mindset of you know detaching from thinking this is the norm this is the normal life that everyone's leading here i'm not quite leading that but actually i don't need that like not having to feel The neediness of being like everybody else—that it's fine for me to tap into my own uniqueness. Yeah, and if I have to be absolutely honest to you, you know, um, it took time. Mm. It took time to understand everything that I was even going through because it's—I couldn't look up to somebody because somebody who has done it, and then I see that person and feel like, okay, it's normal. I was like doing things, and I was on my own path. Uh, I was feeling sometimes a mis- misfit, but something that helped me going was being on stage. You know, if you get to do what you like to do, mm. nothing beats it. It's worth everything. <laughs> and and when I say this, I feel good. I do. I just felt good. Nothing makes when you said me that. feel better. Even today, even today, if you ask me if I have to go on stage and compare to anything else I'm doing, I would prefer going on stage. It. Give, I'm still that seven-year-old kid who likes going on stage, who likes performing the art of magic, who likes just entertaining people in whatever. Whatever capacity she can, you know, whatever she knows, and I try to keep honing my skills every time. Um, so yes, as a kid, it took time to understand that I was, I was, li- I I felt it was a duality. Yeah. Um, because I'm on stage, I'm having the best time of my life, I'm enjoying myself. Uh, as an artist, there was nothing more I could ask for. Like I'm seven years mm. old, eight years old. I see myself in papers. My hoardings mm. are there. People want my autograph. I'm performing a three-hour proper show. Uh, people wait out after my show to you know, like I'm living a great life as an artist. I'm getting to experiment more. I've got a lot of stage time. Everything is good, but the moment my show's over, and I go back to my room, oops, mm. there's nobody to share that happiness with. You know, it's just like I'm happy, but then who I want to share this happiness with? So that like, 
that became like a thing of uh, how do I manage this duality? Like one moment you are the star, and the second moment there's nobody. Um, and how, how did you manage it? Because the, I think it's a really interesting point because there's a lot of people that will be listening that sometimes, you know, when we have something that's pretty unique to us, it's hard for us to explore it because it's easier to be in the crowd with everyone else, right? And feel part of something. And to go and step it alone. I know when I, you know, left my corporate job and I went to go and do something which was very outside of myself, but it was my feeling in, in my soul moment. There was this moment of also feeling really lonely in that, you know, and there is things that I had to do where I really kind of immersed myself in a lot of around self-development growth, listening to TED Talks, I've listened to yours. Those types of things helped me mentally grow my mind. Yes. What did you do to help you get through those times? So when you did come home, yeah, you, you feel that sense of, hey, I'm not doing what everyone else is doing, but over here, this is working. But when I come home, it's different. Tell me, like, from a mental aspect, how did you deal with that? I was, m most of the times I kept myself very occupied. I had very less free time. And that, I think, helped. Mm -hmm. Because I was always on the go, I'm doing something. Because I come home very late in the night, after my show, it's like one o'clock. Yeah. I get up early for promotions and things, and I'm spending time with the, with the team for rehearsals. And I'm, most of the time, I'm busy. So I think that was one thing. But I made a system for myself afterwards as I was growing up on how to deal. I went through anxieties, I went through loneliness, I went like all the drama mm -hmm. has happened. So I'm not, I don't want to let people know, okay, no, no, nothing happened and everything was very hunky dory. Yeah, it did I, not. There were, there were things. But then I'm somebody who wants to focus more on solutions than what, uh, what all I went through. I think we all 100%. go through that, right? So there's one thing that really changed my perspective towards life. I might take a little longer in explaining that, but I think it's worth it. Yeah, totally. Um I felt, first of all, I had to deal with the loneliness. And I realized I have to embrace it. And then I stopped calling it loneliness and started calling it solitude. Because I feel loneliness is, you feel sad about mm. being alone. And solitude is the glory of being alone, mm. right? So embracing solitude became like one of the major things. And, and I was like, how do I practice this? How do I practice solitude? How do I... Um, uh, learn to be happy alone, you know, and then I realized there are many things to do. Um, then I started mindful living, I started writing, and I, when I was 14, I wrote my first book, um, which I didn't release because I was like, it's not good enough. But then I rewrote it again when I was 15 and it got released. It's called Unleash Your Hidden Powers. It turned out to be one of the best sellers. And then I wrote four more books. So, journaling and uh, mindful living and all of those things helped me a lot. And I found one tangible thing to practice lone, uh, solitude was staying in silences. So what I used to do is the days I do not have a show, even if there's one day I don't have a show, I will go in that day of Maanvrat, uh, silence. Yeah. So I wouldn't talk. Zero communication with the world. Initially it started irritating me. Like I want to talk, around, but eventually I would wait for those days. Wow. Like I want to be with myself. Can I have my day of solitude? If I couldn't get full day, I would, uh, I would go half day of silence. But I would wait. So I, I realized practicing silences helps you understand mo yourself more. Because if you want to know somebody, you need to communicate with that person. We communicate with ourselves really less. Mm, so how will we know ourselves? So true. And when we are in silence, when I'm not talking to the external world, and when I say not talking, I'm not even talking in isharas or writing. And I just don't want to talk. Like I'm just, yeah. let me be. And there's so much of self-talk happening. And then... You talk, you talk, you talk, and then you make peace. Just like how you do it with other people. You do that with yourself. You know, you talk, you talk, you understand, you understand. Absolutely. And then you started enjoying silences with other people. Similarly, you start enjoying silences with yourself. And that's been a game changer. Wow. So practicing solitude by going into silences, uh, journaling, writing, mindful living, mm -hmm. all of that. But silences was something like a game changer for me. That is fascinating because, I, you know, I can so see that you know, when you've gone through that and that power of reframing, right? I think that is a real takeaway there, that you could call it loneliness or you can, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, it's an you can call it creed. loneliness or you can call it solitude. And the minute you call it solitude, you get your mindset into the fact that it's almost meditative. It's actually like, you know, when you hear like great speakers, gurus talking and they talk about that solitude that they're looking for and they go their whole life and then they find it, you in that space were like, hang on a second, the thing that has been 
actually difficult for me can be my superpower. Yeah. That's really powerful. And I think that's a massive takeaway that that thing that is in our life that we're going, I'm finding this tough. Just dig a little bit under there and you'll find the magic yeah. of, of what, what is actually sometimes like could be hurting you. It could be a challenge that you can channel that in another yeah. way. Thank you for that. That is so, I'm going to try a bit. Our life is a narrative yeah. we say to ourselves, you know, it's a story we create. Um, you know, and I think it's important that we create, I think a lot of us play a victim mentality mm. and we need to get out of that and we need to be like, we are the leaders of our life and I want to write my story the way I want it and I want to be the leader in the story, not being like how the life is unfair to yes. me. You know, it's dry, all about... Dry, you yeah. you realise, I mean, I, I've got to say that it's so like refreshing to see this level of kind of looking inwards, right? Yeah. Because it took me some time. I think I kind of like... About 35 was the moment that I literally started thinking about myself going, hey, I can drive this car. I've been just sitting in the back seat going, life is happening to me, right? True. When life is actually not something that happens to you, but you know that you can sit in that car yeah. and drive yourself. That is like an awakening moment for anybody who's kind of thinking about this and exploring themselves further. You know, they say that the biggest journey that you go on is the journey of yourself. And I think you just kind of put it so eloquently But that's what you're doing, right? I mean, starting podcasts yeah. now and following your passion. Like you told me you wanted to do this for a very long time. Yeah. You Eventually, you hear yourself and you're like, okay, I have to do this, you know. I always say self-journey, is it's the brave, it's the it's, it's a more braver path. It is. Um, but then... But so are the, so so are the rewarding. rewards. Yes. So are the rewards. Yes. In fact... Even when you go on that journey, I mean, I, when I started my business and then COVID happened and then almost lost everything and had to start again, I didn't feel like, oh my God, because it's like, it doesn't matter. You kind of pick yourself up because yes. you put yourself there. You're just happy that you're doing the thing that you want to do, right? True. So 100% get that. Now, just thinking a little bit, when I touched on earlier, mm. which was, there is also this like performance connection side. I mean, I can see that your talent is 100% there. And I, it doesn't matter what field you're in, even when I think back to my corporate job and I first time had to stand up and, go and I was asked to go and do a talk to 600 people, a leadership talk, and I was absolutely petrified, right? And I remember I just started watching TED Talks. I brought the TED book and I was like, I don't want to stand there and talk about our figures and this is what percentage we went up. I want to go and tell a story about what we do in in a way that connects. Because if somebody comes away and thinks something differently or does something differently, then that's been worth it, rather mm -hmm. than them just glazing over going, okay, it's that many percent, it's the pie chart or whatever. So I wanna ask you, because you know our, our viewers are in various jobs, industries, everyone can take something away from this. How do you get up? First of all, what do you do for nerves? Like when you first get up to, and I know you've been doing it for ages, so you might not probably get them now, but the first time or sometimes when you're doing something new, do you get a moment? Is there something psychological you can do that to kind of get you in the zone or, you know, stop you thinking of everybody watching you? Like, what, is there anything, any tips you that know, you can I, give? You know, I still want to give a nice answer here, but honestly, I started as a kid. You know, and kids don't have fears. So true. You know, they like today, jump in. today you and I, even me, today you yeah. and I are worried about fear of failure, fear of being judged. Am I looking good? What if I fall yeah. down? What if I yeah, anything messes hair. up? Anything, yeah. I mean, so you know, we have fear of judgment, we have fear of failure, we have fear of being like looking like a fool. But uh, like making a fool out of ourselves. But when I was seven years old, or anybody who's seven or six, Kids don't think of fear of failure. They fall down, they get up and run again. They fall again, they get up and run again. They don't think, oh my God, who watched me falling? Oh my God, what will they... They don't do all that. So for me, the benefit is that I went on stage when I was seven. Mm. In fact, uh, I had the chief minister of Gujarat and the entire ministry as, as the guests in that show. The fun bit, I didn't even understand what a chief minister means. Like, I don't know what a minister means. I don't know who they are. I just feel like I have to go on stage, walk first seven steps straight, then walk left, uh, then do this, then say your dialogue, then perform the act. I just knew what I knew. And I thought, I just have to go and perform what I know of. What I don't know of, I, I'm not even thinking about it. So I started performing at such an early age that f the fear wasn't playing yeah. any role there for me. It was only about me following my passion, me going out, oh, I wanted to do magic and now I'm doing it. There was only excitement and fun. 
by the time i grew up and i was in my teens to understand fears and failures yeah. stage had become like the second home so stage was like already there and yeah i mean so the fear of like stage fear was never there and i feel if you if your stage fear is gone a lot of your fears are gone yeah because now people you you're already standing there you already put on the spot in front of like 1000 people every day and that's become normal mm-hmm. so a lot of other fears have you know dissipated yeah yes. I, to- i i do get that i do get that and i think also when i kind of when i started like reading that book and i and you start to actually tell the story so when you feel like you're doing a performance like for example i was asked to do this talk and if i would have gone in with my powerpoint and gone this is what we done da 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 da, yeah. da and it hasn't come from here it hasn't come from your soul yeah that's when the fear sets in right so yes. like you're saying this is what you do this is what you're yeah. born to do so i think when you tap into But your inner I'm voice i'm very curious to know what did you do in the in the presentation event so in the presentation <laughs> so i worked for a big food company right uh-huh. and we done we'd like grown in market share in fact we won every single tender for 2 years to the tune of over 100 million pounds and so they asked me to talk about how do we do that and etc etc and so we were a food company and we really grew in healthcare and leisure and i actually just thought about where does our food go and it's that 80 year old grandma who's come into hospital who keeps going in and out of hospital we've created a food that she can swallow now properly that's now helping her get better right to the 5 year old kid that's got leukemia and his mouth is full of ulcers and he can't eat now so we've created an ice cream that had extra protein and he's so excited about eating and that's what i spoke about i didn't Amazing. need to talk about all the things you were all the always a storyteller you were all always <laughs> and, a storyteller and honestly women were kind of that's amazing to me. way to put out a product and say it when and i that's true also. and it was true. and the thing is when the once i got up there and i started speaking it wasn't about me it was about this story and that was the thing that i true. just found that when it take it away from the the physicality of yourself of the of the judgment that you think that people are going to give that actually you just want to portray something you want to give yes. something and you want to tell this story that was the thing that helped me and also what what was amazing was and the buzz that i got which i think from that moment to now there was always something that i felt like in that storytelling i found a magic right hence i'm here that's amazing that um when 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 the when it all finished we had this two day conference people were emailing me calling me going we never seen anyone stand up and speak like this it's always about wow. numbers figures percentages we've beaten this we've done this and you just spoke about these two stories and it was the most like prominent point of the two days so that is amazing. kind of what what my learning was and when i looked at you when i was watching you one of the reasons i'm sitting in london you know i'm watching your thing and i'm taking in your content and i'm just like it was just so natural i connected with it like you're talking exactly to me so i want you know so thank you for that anyway but yeah. i thought i'd share that with you yeah. so okay so i'm going to ask you a bit of a funny one now okay. uh which is i think most of us have seen the the movie what women want I have haven't. You, you haven't? No, I haven't. Oh my god, you need to watch it. It's like a no. Mel Gibson classic. Okay. Oh, yeah, now so it's on the list. Want? All right, it's on your list. Okay, when it's you get back, you need now. to watch it. Yes. Right. So, he can he's always kind of getting in and out of relationships, thinking like he thinks he knows what women want until one day he can actually hear what women want. Oh my god. <laughs> and let me tell you, you do not want to hear what women oh. want. <laughs> so, tell me no, like a mind reader yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly so in terms of actually on a personal level having this gift of being able to kind of understand what people <laughs> do you find like when you let's say you're going on a date or anything like that you're like i already know this is going to be bad oh, i'm not going to waste God. an hour here like well, i'm how- still sitting over here <laughs> i know this is going to be good okay i'm getting it so i'll tell you um this is Okay, I get this uh, so many times, and I know this is a fun way you're asking, but I'm going to t- twist a little bit to Do explain it. my art form. Okay, and a lot of people think that I can just read minds, like I have some magical power and some supernatural gift, which is not true. This is not anything supernatural or some rebirth or reincarnation. It's a skill. Yeah, it's a learned skill. It's an art form uh, called mentalism, mm-hmm. and. Um, It's not that if you're sitting over here I can know the exact thoughts of your thing I mean I can go get to know a lot of what you're thinking mm. uh but again am I being that observant do I want to know so much not really like I feel it's overrated initially we would feel it will be so good to know what's going on in people's minds 
Oh no, it's not that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's just I think it's always better to only know what they want to tell you. So let yeah. them say it, and that's how the whatever the connection or whoever stranger or dates or anything would work better. Like for me, I don't go on dates first of all, but I always feel like I get to know too much too soon. There's a you know how it works, you know. Uh, I'm sure you know. Like you know yeah. how, how you you meet somebody. Then you only know a little bit about that person, and the yeah. curiosity to know more, and the curiosity to yeah. know more, and that curiosity lets you going and spend that much time with the person, and then yeah. there's so much time has been spent that you know the person better. All that doesn't happen. Like I just know too much too soon. Ah, uh, so I just, yeah, it doesn't work. So out anyway, too. at least you know. You Hence, I'm a- single. Thirty three, I'm single. <laughs> so at least you know. Uh, there's a really good movie to watch because it is yes. absolutely hilarious. You've got to watch I it. Watch that You've one. got to watch it. Um, yeah. And I actually, <laughs> on that point, it's actually interesting that you said that because there is this like notion of when people think of magic, and I think this is a really interesting thing that you're doing, is that you are talking about. in the level of an art form it isn't like some kind of voodoo magic you've kind of yeah. understood this yeah. i think that's that is something that you're actually doing in terms of moving the conversation along yeah. for this form of art yeah and i think um i think it's very important to do that uh for many i do it personally because i have to be true to something that's made me who i am yeah i owe everything i am today of course to my parents but other than that is to my art form uh whatever i know today If even if I can sit here and talk to you in a decent language is because of my art form because I didn't go to school whatever I've learned is from through the art form through meeting people and traveling because of my art form. Mm-hmm. I have to be extremely honest to it. I will not take advantage of the mystery of the art form. Like you don't know yeah. how I perform it, so I can say anything and you have to believe me because I'm doing it. I don't want to do that. I'm extremely on. So that's one reason that yeah. I want to be respectful and honest to my art form always. And hence, I'll always go out and say. uh magic is a very intelligent art form mentalism is a subgenre of magic mm-hmm. uh we do not read minds we only give an illusion of doing so but we do it so well that you feel that we are reading minds mm-hmm. uh that way second thing i feel is that it is important to tell people it's an art form so that it's respected absolutely and yeah. so that um we can have more conversations around it I make it more people centric, you know. Just by saying that, oh, this is some voodoo shit, and you know, I went to yeah. the Himalayas and I was there for these many days, and I got something where I look at people and I get the why. I, I could play all of that, yeah, and I could play it very convincingly, <laughs> you know. Um, but I don't want to do that because people are smart. Mm. People are very smart. How long am I going to sustain with the lie? I also think that. and this is why you know i was really attracted to you there's something that that refreshingness of going i want to be so open and honest with it what it actually does is you know i've got you know i've got three children two daughters as a young person looking at somebody who's now found whatever their uniqueness was and and crafted the art not like going oh, i just got it you know yeah. everything is a craft it doesn't just turn up one day there is there is learning there is understanding it there's finding that family and yeah. understanding more there is a process you don't just yeah. wake up one day and i think it's important that we don't tell people and, and kind of promote this like yeah i just got it yeah. you not just got it there was work that came behind it and i yeah. think having that portrayed out in such honesty is not only an inspiration but it tells people like hey if you want to do it You got to put the work in. You got to put the work in. You got to put the commitment in and it will come out. So thank you for that. And be honest about yeah. it. Yeah. I think I don't know. I feel honesty plays a very big role here. Um like even as a kid when people used to tell me like when they see a 8 year old girl flying in the air or, or levitating a car and disappearing and you know things like those I said it as an illusion as yeah. I am a mentalist now. Yeah. So I said it with those big larger and life acts and everybody used to be like she to has some powers and she's some devi shakti after the sh- show they would come up to me and they would ask me to cure them of their problems through magic there's a robbery in town people have come to me and asked me to find who's the culprit using mm-hmm. my magical powers things like that and at one point of course i just didn't explain to them this is an art form and but when they say that oh you know this is some devi shakti or this is some power that she's got as a kid i used to instantly think You didn't see I was working for eleven months. Yeah, I toiled. I was day and night going to school, working till midnight, rehearsing dialogues. 
I, I, that like I work. So I'm not saying there is no God gift. I think everybody has that yeah. God gift. Everybody is talented and has some sort of talent, some potential in them. But it's you that you have to hone those skills and come Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. So I do not saying I like it's important to respect your hard work also. Yes. Yeah. You know, and give it to you that I've worked hard for this, and hence I get it. And anybody who's going to work hard for anything, I always say, hard work never deceives. Hard 100%. work is something that anybody in the world can deceive you. Anybody in the world can deceive you. It's your hard work that is always going to come back to you. It it doesn't have it does not know what deceiving means. If you put in this, you know how if action has a reaction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every action has a reaction. And thank you so much for this, Sunny. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, from me personally, watching you. that honesty that vibe that kind of actually just bringing it through as an art form and as a female you know i look at you and i go just freaking yeah, yeah. go um Thank you. you know my daughter absolutely loves watching you so so honey shah it has been an absolute ball i can't tell you your energy is just infectious i want to bottle <laughs> it and sell it um so oh, i'm a little you. bit excited i'm a little bit excited cuz i'd quite like you to do something with your mind something yes i like when you say just do something <laughs> <laughs> just, just i surrender to you just do I something <laughs> what does that even mean but okay i get it i get it i get it first of all i had a really good time uh, coming here and um, having such a soulful conversation because I, you know usually when people ask questions we generally know their questions but look there's some standard questions that people mm-hmm. ask us but i really liked how we had this conversation and how it escalated and and your stories have been really Thank interesting you. as well uh, and i love the name that you've give it feel it in your in soul. your soul so um, i really want to ask you yes when i say feel it in your soul mm-hmm. like when you named this i'm sure you must have thought of a lot of things while mm. naming the podcast but right now if i say feel it to your soul what is it that comes to your mind i mean it could be anything like it could be like a moment in your life that you remember mm. or a place that you travel to or a date or a person or or it could be multiple things it could be one thing what comes i oh don't tell me okay <laughs> don't tell anything out loud okay. i want you to think about it in your mind so what comes to you when i say feel it in your soul okay do you have it yes, okay now so before it. i try to figure right. this out before <laughs> i try to figure i see that you've thought of some specific things in your mind and it's more than one right it's more than one there are multiple things but before i get to that you thought of many things we even like changing like when i said um something that you like or like a date or a place to travel you also sometimes think of these things there are some things that have come to my mind and let me know if these things make sense to you yeah um a place in italy does that make <laughs> any sense um maybe a place you travel to yeah Okay. Uh, what's the name? Trevi. Is that the place you travel to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That you feel very close <laughs> about it, right? It's it's that travel was very important to you. You may have traveled to many other places, but this particular travel was has a special space in your heart. <laughs> you <can laughs> My gosh, I I like I did not expect you to say that. Yeah. I um, did not expect you to say that. Because mm. maybe it happened in a moment in your life where it, couldn't have happened and maybe you made it happen so it's a kind of sense of achievement as well mm-hmm. um um you also thought of many other things in your mind mm. a day comes to me right now like a moment in a day i don't know what happened that day because that's not very clear to me but it's a monday a september monday a date in mon- in september that's important to you 20th september Yeah, that's close to you. Do you want to tell us what happened? That if you don't want to say it, that's also no, no. <laughs> it's absolutely no. Fine. It's just, and yeah, it's a very did, recent it, memory. Yeah, it's like yeah, a year I'm or so, two ago. Mm, mm. So on the Trevi, I went to the Trevi fountain. So after I went through a very kind of difficult period where I thought, you know, I was going in my life in the way that I felt. was required of me right until things started to fall apart so my marriage i had two kids i didn't expect you to do this and then anyway i thought you know what 
I'm going to go to Italy. A little bit like my e-pray mo love moment, right? I'm going to go to Italy. I'm taking the kids. My family were like, what are you doing? Taking a five-year-old and a three-year-old to Italy. So we traveled all of Italy. We went to Trabi Fountain and we sat there and we made some wishes and we fully, I mean, when I say I made wishes, every time I get asked to make a wish, I'm fully like in the wish moment. Yeah. So I was like making the wish, chucked it in the fountain. One of the things that I wished for was also, you know, there was this thing about what I wanted to do with my career in terms of starting my own business, following my path, and also, you know, finding love again. Like, I didn't know if that was available to me. Like, I remember my dad going, hi, hi, oh my God, you'll be 40 in five years and you've got two young kids and who will marry? You know, I was hearing all this stuff and I was like, will I, will I be able to rebuild my life again? So that's what I thought about when I went there. And I did meet somebody and he was from Italy, although he lives in London. And um, we had a baby on the 20th of September. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's um, incredible. So I can't actually even believe that you said that. Um, so yeah, so our kind of blended family is like the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced in my life that didn't know if that was available to me. And, you know, people around me probably thought, oh my God, like she's like, literally like in a really bad set of yeah. seconds and felt sorry for me you know you that victim through. thing yeah i hated it and i really hated it i was like i'm not a victim it's right now is the space that i've cleared for me to now create my life and i did so that is super that is inspiring <laughs> that's super inspiring but here's what i wanted to do even more like this was i tried to get it more random things that came to my yeah. mind when you were thinking of so many things i tried to catch some words mm -hmm. There was also Taylor Swift, by the way, for some reason. I don't know. Maybe you like to dance on those songs or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you like to dance with your kids on those songs. Yeah. That's yeah. what you thought now. Yeah. Um, let's get more specific. Oh okay. my God. <laughs> let's go back to, you know, the th the, you thought of a few words when I asked you to what comes to your mind when you say, um, when I say, feel it in your soul. Um, you thought of many different different things. I try to catch those words, but then there were some specific words in your mind. Let's stick to those specific words now. And is it okay? Before we get into this, is it any way possible that I could have known this? No. Like you have, I haven't like, set this up, you know and you what? haven't told that to me. I, I did not expect you, and I moved from some things as well. And I did not, when you said it, that's why I got so emotional. I was like, holy sh oh my God, like how has that come out? Because I wasn't expecting to, to yeah. hear that. I, and I, I you know, I thought it was going to be a general kind of like, hey, you're, that was so specific. I mean, it totally blew my mind, honestly. What were the three words in your mind? Uh, something with family? Yeah, it was my three kids. It was uh, Jay, Anya and Sophia and... I think the reason that they're in my mind is because they've been like, they've been my strength. And the addition of Sophia coming in our life has literally made our family like this beautiful bubble that I, is beyond my expectation of what I felt, yeah. I felt what I thought. Because when I was at that moment in Trevi Fountain, it was like this almost like fear of like, could I, could I achieve that? Yeah. And something more came. So yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. Thank you. You've literally you blown my mind. Here's what I'm gonna very... do. Before I'm going to end this, you know this coaster has been here from the start. Yes. And you had three words in your mind. And the words that were extremely important to you. Again, one was kids, the family, and there was one more thing. You can't hide from me. <laughs> There's one more thing. Do you want to say it out loud? Yeah. Uh, I, I, do you want to read what's written in there? Yes, God. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, my, my fiance, yeah, yeah. So there's family, kids and the fiance. Yeah, yeah, who, who actually has been. So the reason why it's so important as well is that when you find somebody, when you're on this path and you want to go and live out, you'll feel it in your soul moment that you need to surround yourself, yeah. you know, like your family was. You need to surround yourself with the people that are going to be like your cheerleaders, your support system to get you there. And that's, that's this. So thank you. <laughs> Did not expect that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to show that, yes. by the way. Literally, I don't know where I'm showing, like, I, this has blown my mind. Honestly, blown my mind. So, honey, you have been 
just uh, phenomenal. You, Thank you. Thank you are you magic so in every sense of the Thank word. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think even your story, the way you've said it, is so incredible. I think I want to sit with you <laughs> off camera and know everything because We're doing you it. have really <laughs> reinvented your life. I think multiple times, not just once, yeah. once when the job thing happened and starting yeah. your own business and the COVID happened and then doing this and finding love again and then kids and it's incredible. So kudos yes. to you and all the love for everything you do ahead in your life. We are definitely catching up. 100%. Definitely. Thank you so much. Sammy. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you.